Well, welcome to the Hunt and Land Man podcast, Caleb, episode 25? 25. We're actually recording live today. That's Wyatt's phone in the background here at Sports Center in Natchez. Um, Wyatt, good buddy of ours, allowed us to uh, video this thing and record this thing here at his store in Natchez. If you've never been to the store, it's an unbelievable store. And their web website, southernprofessionalgear.com, is an unbelievable website. They sell a lot of the products with my guest here today that we both use. Cody Kelly, if you don't know Cody, um, he's been on TV, been doing it as long as I have or longer uh, with Small Town Hunting. Uh, lives up north of here in Mississippi and uh, grew up just out, like I did hunting and fishing. Has a ba- baseball background like a lot of outdoorsmen do, a lot of sports sports people do. And uh, Cody, thank you for being here. Man, it's good to be here. Well, uh, Cody is actually, uh, he had to come down here and do some business. I've got two closings today in Natchez, so it all worked out really good. The real estate business is still rocking and rolling. And uh, before we get too far with this, as always, this episode is brought to you by Southern Ag Credit. They're the title sponsor of our Hunt Land Man podcast and the Hunt Land Man TV show. They take great care of us. In fact, I was talking at 10 o'clock last night. That's how committed their loan officers are. At 10 o'clock last night, a loan officer was texting me about a deal we're working on. So they're committed to making deals work just like the Hunt Land Man crew is. So they're a great crew. Um, Cody, um, you know, Cody started a you started with Primos, correct? Correct. That was uh, Cody started with Primos and uh, helped grow that company to the great company it is today, and uh, has done a lot of things with a lot of the people we know. And um, now I know one of the things he's most excited, is passionate about the new show, Small Town Hunting, and they're a little bit of everywhere. I I don't know if anybody is as many places as Small Town is as far as uh, if you want to watch it, you can find it somewhere. And uh, also, Cody is the uh, main marketing guy behind Backwoods Attractions, which we've been using for years. Great products. And the more and more you find out about their products and how they're coming up with some of the seed blends and the feed blends, which is going to go into what we're going to talk about today. The main focus of today's episode is the new velvet season in Mississippi. Uh, Cody, before we start on that, tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, how we got here today. And tell us why you're so qualified to talk about this, uh, this subject. Well, I mean, from from the show side, like Slade said, we myself, Chris, and Keith, we all started at Primos, um, and you know we cut our teeth there. And the Primos side of things, I think, was one of the the best for the platform because we really figured out or learned marketing, and then you learned product development, you learned you know the the television side and mm-hmm. advertising side. So from that side of the company. You, you everything was kind of in house, and then when you go out on, you know, your own for small town hunting, it was a lot different because we're promoting the products that we trust rather than the products that we're we manufacturing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but you take all that together, and I think that's what's kind of made small town. But our goal with it, <laughs> and, you, and you joked around, you know, saying I don't think it's you know not anywhere; it's everywhere. Right. And and our editors and producers will <laughs> they feel the pain of that, mm-hmm. but. It's, you know, and you probably hear this too. Oh, man, TV ratings are down. or it, it, mm. TV's not going anywhere, but how people are watching it is changing. Correct. So so I feel like, and you're seeing this too, which is why you're doing a podcast now. You, you know, just started your, your new digital, you know, venture. Mm-hmm. And how, how people are watching is different. You got to go find those eyeballs. And so that was kind of our goal with Small Town was – we, we want to go find all the eyeballs and, and have, you know, everybody have an opportunity to watch it. But one thing led to the next. So we were doing that, and actually Joseph, the owner of Backwoods Attraction, he called and he wanted to talk about a partnership with Small Town. And one thing led to the next, and then I kind of rolled into the marketing role there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about it on the drive down here. I think, I think y'all were the very first people – Backwoods partnered with outside. Of course, it started with Small Town. Then I went to work there, and I think you guys were what, trained the, assassins. Yeah, with trained assassins mm-hmm. was the first other TV show that we worked with. Mm-hmm. Um, and cause you know with with Backwoods Attraction, the core business at that time was Mississippi and Louisiana, and you guys were the perfect fit for that. So you know you you've really been me and you talk a lot, and and have really been in the the backside of taking what your clients from real estate are needing on their properties and rolling that into 
we need to produce those type products. So there's there's been a lot of product development that me and you've worked on through the years. Right, right. And, and I like what Cody said. The main thing I picked up from what he said was find the eyeballs. And I've been saying that, yep. you know, uh, yes, TV ratings is going down, but I guess I guess uh, that's a relative term because they're still watching it on their TV. That's right. You know, but where are they finding it on YouTube? Are they finding it on the Waypoint app? Are they finding it on MOTV? You know, they're finding all these different places, and you, that's what you got to do today. The the dinosaurs are saying, look, I'm just outdoor. I'm just sportsman channel. Those times are over. That's right. Because more TV gets watched on his cell phone right here than does on the TV these days. Yep. I mean, used to be, and you're, you know, you're about my age. I remember when the Monster Bucks came out every year, and I couldn't wait because, you know, Outdoor Channel was just getting going, and you got to watch all your favorite hunters that hunted with Realtree at the time hunt on Monster Bucks, or if it was Mossy Oak, it was Mega Bucks, or whatever, or, or Primos at yep. the time. And it was so cool because it's like you got an update of the people that you watched every year. Like, if you want to watch Nick Munt, well, you know, at that time, the only time you could watch him if he was, you know, on, on, on something like that, the Milk River. That's right. Or something like that. So, you know, those times have definitely changed. You know, when I got to uh, Primos, you know, the, the DVD – um, we were doing five or six different DVDs at the time. Had cow DVD, had the mm-hmm. the big bulls. You had you know all. Oh, the, those monster bulls was yeah. just. And like I remember the meetings that we had. You know, you sit down and you're laying out the hunts, and then you're proofing the hunts. Like there was a lot that went into putting that DVD out. And then now, you know, to be honest, I'm, I I kind of miss those days because mm-hmm. now it's like, all right, man, the hunt was phenomenal. Like. Let's get it out there. Let's mm-hmm. put it out. Let's get the episode out. It's it's immediate, and I I, I kind of miss the anticipation days you right. know, back in the day, like you're talking about. I remember watching y'all hunt all these unbelievable places elk hunting, and uh, you know being from the south. And if you this is a good point, if you Cody and I both grew up in Mississippi, if you've never gone and done a hunt like an elk hunt or mule deer hunt or I've gone caribou hunting and some of those hunts everywhere, it's a new appreciation appreciation for hunting so what i mean by that you know if you're a a turkey hunter you know you're so much involved in the hunt you know you're calling you're setting up you're controlling the narrative if you will or or, are somewhat controlling and those hunts out west you know i remember the first big hunt i went on outside of mississippi was a caribou hunt and we'd hike up on these foothills every day and somebody would shoot one every day and then we'd pack them out on our backs i remember thinking like Wow, this is hunting. <laughs> yeah. And until that time, like a sheep hunt or mountain goat hunt, or none of that really appealed to me. But when I did that, I was like, okay, it's a lot more. Forget the animal, if That's you will. Right. Yeah. It's about the experience and the hunt and the places you get to go. And it was it was eye opening for me. And um, if you are a turkey hunter and you've never been elk hunting, look, there's nothing I like better than a turkey goblin in a hardwood bottom in Mississippi. But when that elk bugles, which Caleb will find out about this for the first time in September, whoo, it's a different world. And and it's you know we always told the you know on small town and at Primos, and of course we'll we'll instill that in us from from the very beginning. But you know everybody, I guess sometimes TV gets a bad. You know they're trying to mm-hmm. tell me what to do, or they're 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 not experts, or or right. this or that. And and we never claim to be, but. We have been blessed to be in great hunting environments and situations where we can screw up. Mm-hmm. And when you can screw up, you that's when that's when you learn. Mm-hmm. And so I, I remember, you know, when I really first started at Primos, I'd go with Will and and hearing the stories of how many they screwed up, how many they missed. Mm-hmm. And, and they were calling side by side, and, and they were sh- trying to shoot them at 40 yards, and, and the bows weren't what they were, to, were are today. So they're, they're ducking the air, and they're missing, and, you know, they're quarter two when they get there. They don't get a shot. And then they were like, you know, they got caught in a situation where the caller couldn't get up there, and they called, and the bull walks right by them. And mm-hmm. they're like, that, that's what you do. you got to drop back and call. You know, and then turkey hunting, you get a hard-headed turkey, and you're like, you call your, your mm-hmm. buddy and said, man, I need you to go with me in the morning. He's, he's on the end of a logging road. I need you to sit back 50 yards. And it's the same concept, same but, like, that's that's the hunt. That's mm-hmm. that's learning how to hunt. And it is funny. It, just, it, it excites milk last night, by the way. It excites me just to thinking about it uh, going because it really is. It's, it's something special. And, look, you know, people say, oh, man, I can never afford to go ahead. Look, most of – not a lot of the times – 
either you're hunting on public or you're hunting right beside public. Right. So if you ever think about going to elk hunt, start putting in for tags and stuff now because, uh, like Arizona, you can go on the best hunt in the country over the counter tag, but it'll take you 20 years to draw it. Right. So start start putting your kids in at 18 now. When my kids get old enough, I'm going to start putting them in so they can kill a monster bull one day. Right. Yep. Well, let's get to the topic at hand. Okay, um, if people don't know, Mississippi, it is official now. September the 16th through the 18th, we're going to have a velvet-only season, bucks only. Um, you know, and, and, and if people don't realize this, what this changes, if you've ever run cameras significantly, there's something that happens from around September the 16th. You know, when they start either think about shedding their velvet or they shed their velvet, their whole mentality changes. It's like yep. summertime's over, the rednecks with bows are in the trees. It's yep. like their brain tells them that. And you'll see a lot of success with people that first week of October, and a lot of times it's those deer are still on those patterns. I feel like during September 16th through 18th, it's gonna be a get, it's gonna be a lot of big deer. Killed. Oh, there ain't no doubt. It's a it's a game changer for the state. I mean, um, and and I mean, you talked a little bit about this before, but that I have heard some negative. You know, I have when, too. when you when you hear it at first, everybody's excited. And I do think a hundred percent the good outweighs the bad. Like I think it is a mm-hmm. huge opportunity for the state. Um, but if if people could do this at low pressure do their homework, have everything set up, it, it could be an opportunity to kill deer that otherwise deer. you could that, kill, that you may not be able to kill till the rut yeah. or something like that. And it's, it's funny, I do, of course, we have testing grounds with backwoods mm-hmm. attraction. And that's in Yazoo County, yep. not too far north of here where we are now. Yep, and uh, I mean, it's a special, special place. Mm-hmm. Well, I, when when this got passed, or they started talking about it, I went back and looked at pictures of of a bunch of trail cameras that were saved, and uh, there is a very, very interesting thing that I found was September 14th, 15th, we had all velvet bucks. September 16th through the 18th, every day was more hard horn. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be interesting to me on, on that side of things. Of course, when I heard the season, they were like, oh, yeah, it's got to be velvet only. If it's not velvet, you can't shoot. Well, then when the law came out, mm-hmm. it is it doesn't have to be available. Right, right, right. So, um, it's it's going to be interesting. That that is right at that window, like it is. you're talking about. And, and and it's going to be it's interesting to hear that because some areas like it's going to be like, and I'm talking about like 15 miles. You know, for instance, our, our mutual friend Barrett, his deer hold their velvet longer than almost anywhere else. That little area right there in in the southwest corner of the state holds their velvet longer than they do over towards my house, which is only. 10 miles away and so it's going to be a very specific now i'll say this the same guys that are killing them the first two weeks of october are going to be the same guys who come 16th yep. through the 18th they're just going to be better at it now you're going to get some lucky people and things like mm-hmm. that something that um i think is is i haven't heard or seen on social media people talking about so this is not normal for mississippi we get 16th through 18th and then closed for what yep. 10 11 days okay so Typically, like last year, I killed my big deer in Mississippi on October 7th. Okay, do you know the reason I killed him on October 7th? Probably cool for it. <laughs> it wasn't, a, we didn't get a north wind until the 6th and the 7th. I yep. hunt the 6th, got out of there clean, which is rare. We're, look, look, we're, I'm not talking sugarcoated. Right. I'm hunting over a feeder that's with right. backwoods in it. There's And, and that's, the way I, that's the way I like to hunt. Yep. Call me whatever. I, that's the way I like to hunt. My preferred method is, is them coming to a feed, and that's because that's how I grew up hunting in the right. south and things like that. I love hunting Texas like that. Now, I do have an appreciation for how we hunt in Missouri and things like that, food and manipulation. Uh, but anyway, um, got out of there clean on the 6th and killed him on the 7th. Uh, so, being that we're going to have, okay, 16th through 18th, and then it's going to close, there's going to be, a in the Randy Bird song terms, we're going to be risking it for the biscuit. Yep. If that wind's like iffy, but he's coming in, you may have to, to scent free everything you can do and, and try to get in there and kill him because it may be a deer like that leaves in the first we got. That's there. right. Yep. So it's going it, that's going to be interesting and it's I love bow hunting and I love early season more than anything. Um, you brought up the negative. It, I'll let you talk about it because I've heard the same thing as far as the negatives of what people are saying. Oh, I don't like this idea or whatever. What yeah. What are you hearing? And and of course, a lot of it is change. 
it, it mm-hmm. you're, you're going to have negative in any time there's change. But the comment I heard yesterday, and I, I'm not going to talk, you know, who it was, but very, very good friend, and and uh, and, and he's a business owner, and uh, that can benefit off of people buying feed for early season, trying to buy food plot seed to get earlier. Hey, line four, somebody. Sports center visit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the only negative I heard was if if we're gonna extend it three days, you know, why why didn't they take something away? Or, I agree. Know, do, do we need to run it to January thirty first and in South Mississippi run it to February fifteenth, or do we need to look at shorten it? Um, I, I personally don't have an opinion on that. I, mm-hmm. I think it gets back to the huge controversy that everything's going right now with fanning turkeys and and all this stuff. The game and fish sets the 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 laws based on how many animals we shot. Mm-hmm. So if if the turkeys, if you can shoot three, what at that point, if you're gonna what what does it matter for as you fanning, kill? no decoys, calling them in or went you know, all that kind of stuff, if if you're still shooting three. Now if you're if you're worried about a decline and you cut down and I'm not getting on this controversial mm-hmm. subject, but if you if you cut it down to two and then do away with fanning like you're worried about a mm-hmm. decline. But same way on the deer. I, I've got mixed emotions on the length of the season and all that kind of stuff. Because if you're only gonna kill three bucks, what does it matter? Yeah. If if you shoot your if you shoot your first buck on September sixteenth, you got two left. Mm-hmm. And if you shoot your first buck on Speaking October, of, you know, you got, it, it is only one. That's correct. It's only one during that time. Cause I was thinking, hey, well, everything sets up right. We yeah. may tag out. <laughs> that's not the case. Yep. Um which I think was smart. Yeah, I mean I, I do too. Um, you know, I agree, I, I agree we can't keep adding to the season because it's kind of like them trying to take gun rights away, which we won't even get on that tangent yep. right now. They, you never, We never get more conservative in the state. What I mean by that is when Cody and I grew up, you had uh, basically muzzle loaders with no sights for yep. the most part. I don't remember exact laws, but then we went, okay, okay, we got inline muzzle loaders. We can now shoot them at 150 yards. Yep. You know, we're going private land only. We're going 45, 70. Yep. Which is not a primitive weapon, right? <laughs> oh, now we're going to shoot a thirty-five Whalen, which is a three hundred yard rifle. That's right. It's just one bullet in it. Oh well, now it's gun of choice. Yep. And you know this progressed. It's gun of choice on private lands during this time. So basically, we got a two and a half month gun season. Yep. I do think that's too much. Yep. Um, I would like to see it go back to some. I mean, there used and to you kind will, of. I would say your opinion on that is probably seeing what that does in other states mm-hmm. like you're not going off an opinion right, of right. like nobody needs to hunt that long you're going off an opinion of okay let's look at what missouri does yeah 10 day rifle. what kind of deer do they have let's let's look at iowa where you got a draw system mm-hmm. and all that um so you're basing your opinion right. off of a lot of information not just you know hey man here in south and look i'm not saying my opinion's right i like to bow hunt that's right a five-year-old deer if you say, look, I like to kill my three bucks and I like to kill my what is it, six does because I like to feed my family, amen, brother. That's that, Look, I say it all the time. I like deer management. But if I sell a piece of property to a guy and he shoots the first two-year-old eight-point walks out there, hey, that is your God-given. Yep. That, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. No, I wish you wouldn't. Right. You know, I wish we could manage a little better, but there's nothing wrong with what you do. In fact, I'll get, tell a story. Like, I bought my place four years ago. I've never killed a deer on it. I've uh, tried. I've tried to bow hunt pretty much only, and uh, and I've seen some 140 something inch deer. And neighbors end up killing them. Different story. But uh, last year, my little boy, who has not been ate up with deer hunting, he right. killed a doe, he killed a turkey, and he likes it. He doesn't love it. I think right. he likes it more because I like right. to bring him more than anything. And I haven't tried to push it on him by any means, but last year he told me, Daddy, I want to kill my first buck from my wall. I said, absolutely, buddy. We got the box stand set up. Uh, I hardly didn't even hunt this spot at my house. Sitting there, spikes, does come out, and he spotted him. He said, Daddy, there's an eight-point. I said, yeah, sure enough he is. And uh, I said, now, Bentley, they've got some bigger ones here if you want to wait. Oh, man, but if you want to bust him, it's up. I want to bust him. <laughs> Boom. Yep, 100%. Now, that deer, I will remember for the rest of my life. If I would have killed a five-year-old eight-point in, in that you know opening week there, that would be another five-year-old eight-point I killed. But that was important. That happened like it's supposed to. And now, I actually made him pass a deer. Uh, well, we call him Ricky Bobby. He named him. We, we, I made him pass a four-year-old nine-point tw- twice last year. I said, look, Bentley, you killed your first one. We're mm-hmm. going to win on the right one now. That's right. So, uh, so I've got him hooked now. What so, was your first deer? 
four point. Yep, mine's a spike. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's, mm-hmm. that's that's the thing. Everybody, you, you I think you need that. You know, I do I would, too. I would never want to take that away from from deer hunting. You mm-hmm. know, it's is the opportunity to you, you have to grow. You know, and you've seen it ruin people. That, is why you think hundred percent, and and people. It gets to the point on social media, and you post a deer, and you never fails. Somebody's gonna scroll through that man. Been a good one next year. <laughs> that's or the why, that's the low. Been why, a good one next year. Yeah, I mean, good gosh. Like, that's, I actually serious. do that funny uh, when Wyatt, who I'm sitting in his office right now, when he killed a 183 last year, and we were hunting in Kansas, said, "Oh, been a good next year." Yeah. You know, and, and the thing is, it's like if you post it and and you shot a deer, somebody thinks three or four mm-hmm. years old, and they comment, they don't think anything about it. Like, dang, Slade, you hunt premium properties mm-hmm. all across the country like you know better like that's maybe what they're thinking and so they throw that comment in there mm-hmm. but what they don't think is that 15 year old kid that's on social media scrolling he sees that it's like, like thanks he can't maybe, shoot one maybe he hasn't had the opportunities and mm-hmm. only been a few times and so then he gets the opportunity and ah, man I, people are going to talk bad about me if i shoot that deer so then he passes then he doesn't and then he loses interest mm-hmm. because he hasn't had any success yeah if you're only if you're only if you're only valuing your hunt is I gotta have a five year old to post on social media or I'll get picked on. Man, we're we're doing bad. Oh, there's no doubt. We're doing bad. Um, I say this with turkey hunting all the time because I got friends on every end of the spectrum. Oh, Slade, you hunting them over strutting a decoy. Oh, Slade, you hunting them over decoys or you know you doing this, you doing that. The only I mean, look, I don't look if you want to shoot them over corn, which is illegal in Mississippi. I, I'm totally against that. Yeah. I just don't, I just, whatever that I don't like that at all, but any other way legally, uh, I'm not, when I go turkey hunting or deer hunting and I'm not trying to prove to anybody, I, 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 either. I yeah. like it. Yep. In fact, if I have my bow in my hand, it's a four year old and older buck. Now I've owned certain areas. I, you know, I respect for the area or whatever, maybe five year old. That's when I'm going to hunt. And if, look, if I kill a 140 the first day when me and you go to Iowa and you kill a booner, you're not going to be any happier than I am. Oh, yeah. I, it's, but it's hard for mm-hmm. people to get there. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of people out there that can't get to that point, and they don't understand the, the, what the negativity can do to someone else. Mm-hmm. Like that, And that, that it just drives me. Not, and to be honest, I, it, I'll, I'll have more tangents during fall going through social media mm-hmm. where you start reading the comments. It's like, guys, you don't think that there's there's a, a, a 15, 16, mm-hmm. 17-year-old guy, or th- there's people that get into hunting in their 30s. Right. Like, and so they have to have, just because he's a 30-year-old man doesn't mean he's got the experience you do mm-hmm. at 30, 32, 33 years old. It, mm-hmm. It's different. It's, it's based on years. You started with that spike or four point right, right. and you've you've grown into your own opinions and mm-hmm. now you will pass young deer but mm-hmm. like everybody has to get to that point and it, it blows my mind but i know we're getting off topic right but I, I, t- I like the off topic and it's the same way with elk look a 285 inch five by five runs by me the first day and we get there i ain't killed enough of them he gonna probably get dr- and yep. it has to do a lot with the area i know that area i'm hunting is a 280 to 320 type of area so you know it is what it is but when I'm eating that elk for a year and a half, them horns don't... That's a fact. Look, and they ain't... I try to make the argument that my deer ground meat is as good as my elk ground meat. I'm over that argument. It's not. <laughs> it's just not. Good Lord, that different, elk ground different meat taste. is good. Yep. Well, Caleb and I are going... Uh, it's It worked out good because we're going 9th to the 14th to Colorado. Ryan's going to and a client of mine. And then we'll be back on the 14th. Make sure everything's good on the 15th and kill a big rat buck on the 16th. It's gonna be good. What have you have you thought about? Uh, now y'all gonna be at the testing the grounds in, or y'all gonna be open? So we're waiting on the Kansas draw. Um, uh, now I I do know there will be someone bow hunting testing grounds on that 16th through the 18th, but um, we're waiting on the Kansas draw. Me, Chris, and Keith all three put in. Whoever doesn't draw will be there for sure. Um, we did the early muzzleloader for Kansas. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. And we're gonna be in. Uh, we'll be in Kansas mid October. Me and White and Birdsong. <laughs> Um, I think who else? I think just us three. But uh, we've had great success during that time. And and speaking of, so what I kind of wanted to talk about, we, we have got off on tangents this early bow season. Is so, what does that mean? Well, how do you need to prepare? Uh, what do you need to do? Okay, I've already so so my field in front of my house. I call it my dove field. Yep. Well, being that we're going to be hunting on September sixteenth through eighteenth, it's probably not going to get a dove shot. That's in. right. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, that deer I called Ricky Bobby, he's going to probably come in there. And usually, last year, I planted some Milo and some brown top, dove, deer kind of combo. Yep. This year, I think I'm going to go in there. I'm going to look at when it's supposed to rain, but I'm probably going to take late July, early August, same time I plant my food plots in the Midwest. And I think I'm going to go with some peas or, yep. you know, backwards blend. Uh, something like that that I can go in there. I'll get my ground ready. The deer are going to smoke it. Yep. I know they are, but I don't need but three days. That's right. And I'll, I'll tell it to that. I have had more people and buddies talking on the backwood side, like totally changing their yeah. food plot plans. Like normally it's like, you know, hey, I'm going to time the rain between October 1st and October 15th, get mm-hmm. some seed planted. Now I'm hearing – Hey, I'm thinking about on a few small food plots. I'm gonna go in in August, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with a turnip blend from Backwoods. I'm, I'm gonna go with lazy. Or, now, can you uh, do turnips that early in the south? Yes. Okay. And then I will say they performed. So the testing grounds last year, I think we planted, we watched the rain, and we planted as close as we could to the middle of August, and we planted trophy acre. Okay, which and, is what you've seen me kill, like the big eight you were yep. editing another. That's what I killed that over. Yep. So, and we we had phenomenal results. And what we found is our shooters mm-hmm. in early October, they were on the feeders in the trophy acre plots. So they were gravitating towards the 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 uh, rape and the radishes and the and the brassicas. They gravitated towards them and the vegetation right out of the gate. Now, did you get at the testing grounds, will they later in there, do they mess with the turnips much? Yes, I will say it, it's, it still comes down, I think, the weather. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, when it gets cold, um, we had one plot, uh, it was called Lost Acre, and it was, bought, they, they, it was the number one early season plot. It was all trophy acre. They gravitated to another plot, which was probably three or four hundred yards from there, and it was in Big Three, which is wheat, oats, rye, mm-hmm. and you, they gravitated towards that. And then every time there was a cold push, you could go put somebody there, and it was full of deer. So it, they definitely. I mean, I love Trophy Acre Blend just because of. I mean, we've had a lot of results. Off See, of it. I just learned something. So if. I know how good that blend does, and if they will smoke that stuff early season like that, that's a lot hardier than a pea yep. or a soybean or and something it like that. It gets up, it's thick, mm-hmm. you, it, it's got uh, broad leaf, so you're not you're not dealing with weeds. You're not and you know trying to plant early. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. You're suppressing your weeds, right? And uh, I mean, I have heard because a lot of people watch the testing grounds on the digital side, and they saw that happen. And then you know we we kind of documented like we we did not expect. To have that type of uh, look at Craig. Hold Craig's on, let's look. This guy, hey Craig, made that money yet? You you're on a podcast right now with Cody Kelly and got Cameraman Caleb here. Say hey to everybody. Like, we on a podcast? You're yeah, it's on, live right you're, now. You're live right now. I told him to decline the call, yeah, but he answered. No. Well, look, you on the golf course already, or what you doing? We're actually talking about hunting. I know you don't really think about that till about October first, but we are. We you are hang all there. his stands, don't you? One hundred percent. No, this year I'll think about it earlier because they got a building season. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. Well, Craig and I are in a lease together, uh, and we are we're planning that, and I'll go into that. Craig, I'll holler back at you in a minute. All right, let's... What's going to be cool, Cody? Is I'm a, I, I'm. I like preparing for hunting yep. season as much as I do deer season. No, I like turkey season during the season best, but I like preparing for deer season and talking about it. So it's going to be cool because the things we do this year, if velvet season does remain the same, it's going to it's going to progress. What we do this year will not be what we do in three 100%. years from now. What plants we're doing, how we're doing our feeders, um, you know, there's there's and, and we're talking about planting right now, but the feed which is probably going to even be more popular, people are going to start feeding earlier. Yep. Okay, we're dealing, like in this area, we're dealing with bears a lot. I've been telling all my clients, uh, hey, start using some stuff with the soybeans in it because if y'all don't know that, if you're using products with soybeans in it, like the Flame Kiss, you you know the bears won't won't come to it as much. Yes, maybe those products do cost a little more, but they if the deer eating and the bears aren't, it doesn't matter. That's right. You know if yep. you're if you're putting ten sacks of corn in your feeder or, or protein feed, and then you know, the bears are eating, then it don't matter what it costs. Yeah, and and flame kiss was one of the top products in the backwoods traction lineup anyway, but that has slowly been 
one of the number one phone calls in is they found out flame kissed with a soybean blend, mm-hmm. like the bears, it, it's fixing the problem. And so, and you were the first person that kind of came to us and was like, hey, I've noticed this. And then it's been constant. Yeah. And what I like, I, I, was, I think me and Cody had this conversation today. I'd like to talk to them more about maybe we need to start looking at, okay, we're going to develop a line. Hey, these are bear free. And yep. you know, I'm sure nothing's perfect. That's they right. say the bear's got to come eat it first and then he gets a stomach ache and then he doesn't, yep. doesn't come back. But this is going to be an issue we're dealing with. Um, until we, I guess we get a bear season and they get smart because right yep. now they just walk up. I had a client yesterday. He texted me last night property I sold him in St. Francisville, which is going to be episode five. We sold him that property, had a feeder up, and he sent me a picture of a bear cub. I said, You've got to, uh, I said, You got to switch to soybeans. Yep. But, um, so from a feed standpoint, okay, uh, you know, you're going to, we're going to be protein or something with protein, and usually about mid September is when your people are going to switch to rice bran. Yep. Um, or, or, you know, a uh, high-end feed. What I do, you know, I'm a, I'm a corn, rice bran, trio type of guy. But, you know, and, and, and then, okay, the, okay, let's say I got 10 feeders going. Let's just use that. Okay, here's the three spots where my bucks are coming. And I'm a, I finagle stuff. And what I mean by that is, like, a lot of times I know my neighbors, and he's getting pictures of him too because I heard it heard through a buddy. Okay, if he's feeding corn and bran. What can I feed? You know, can I feed Flame Kids? Can I feed Game Changer? Yep. And, uh, and and so I'm always like, I go out and, okay, I'm going to put Rice Bran here. I'm going to put Game Changer here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to coat with Crave. Something I didn't even bring up, which is probably, if I had to say the backwood product that I use most is Crave. And let me tell you why. And I did, I've done several videos on this. So I go feed in my yellow buggy and my gray truck all the time on all the spots. All my spots in Mississippi are within five miles of my house, and it helps me. And so I go feed on that kind of stuff. It's my therapy. People go play golf, Craig. Yep. I go feed and run cameras, what I like to do. And anyway, uh, every time I go, I keep a bottle of Crave in my truck. Every time I fill up a feeder, I spray. What do those deer get used to? Oh, fresh yep. feed, Crave. And inevitably, there's human scent yep. there. That, that smell, and, and I will tell you, 100% and I've seen it work. If you will condition using Crave, like mm-hmm. they, we're the same way at testing grounds. You go to a feeder, like there's not a buggy that goes to a feeder that does not have Crave in the mm-hmm. back. It's like you said, it's fresh feed. You go in, same thing, you're there about the same amount of time, pop the top on it, fill it up, spray the Crave, spray the area mm-hmm. down a little bit, and you roll on. Well, same thing, a lot of times, and, and it gets into tactics. I know you wanted to get into kind of what you were thinking, but, and you want to I, I will 100% on that velvet season I will have a rotation going so I'm going to schedule where that feed day is falling mm-hmm. into that most likely for the opening day where right. you go in at lunch I'm going to fill the feeders up spray the crave down you leave that afternoon is in there and you hunt if the wind's right but you can spray crave in the area and it will 100% help you and, and with you, cutting he the wind. said condition and yep. what he means by that is now Yep. Now is the time. So when you go, maybe, you know, it is a strong scent, so maybe the first time, just a little, and then put some on the feed, of course, to make them eat it more and whatever, and you're conditioned. So at my spots, like if you watched last year when I killed that buck on October 7th, and you see this blocking the frame, that is a bottle of Crave in the tree blocking the frame <laughs> yep. because I don't believe you can be 100% scent free. Now, I'm a scent Nazi. I think you can be... 90 95 percent but especially during september you're gonna be sweating at some point your gear we have to pack more gear than the normal guy from cameras we got two people in the tree the key is a scent that's not there all the time so so human scent because we feed all the time is there yep okay so they know okay okay i can tolerate i've tolerated that since i've been a fawn eating in these food plots at these feeders okay so then slay goes out and he does everything with his scent products lemon shield and he gets gets clean all right grits in a tree and he's got five percent scent out there but there's a thousand percent crave going on because i spray it in the tree and i start doing that so when it gets real close to the season, I go over my stand, I spray it in the tree. Yep. So it's the same thing. Last year, that seven-year-old buck I killed came from straight downwind, and I'm pretty sure he blew at us on the way in. But he smelled all those other deer yep. to feed her, and, you know, everything, and, and, and it got him killed. And I think that's a win in the scent department. I think you throw, I think you throw something else in their senses where if they smell human, they it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they, they move, but... 
when they're smelling that, but they turn around and they're they're like fresh feed. But mm-hmm. it's like he, he, fresh feed. Well, it must it's be a just, little more human than normal, but I'm going to risk feed. it because I really like that flame <laughs> kissed. You know, yeah. like it, and it sounds cheesy, but I mean, it's it's like you see it time and time again work. You know, if I go get this is Sports Center, some of the best areas in Southwest Mississippi, up and down the river, right here, some of the best hunters. If I interviewed every hunter that consistently kills mature deer with their bow, they we're going to have the same conversation. And what I mean by that is scent. All these little things they do right. Everybody does the big things. Yep. It's like these little things. Oh, well, I do like this. I do like this. And um, it's, that's the funnest part to me. So what I, Craig called, so we're, um, we're fixing to, uh, this is another good topic with Backwoods. We're going to all spin for the summer, and we're going to go with like a flame kiss because we can still get that protein. And look, let's be honest, stuff is expensive. Expensive. Mm-hmm. Corn may be 12 bucks a bag this That's fall. Right. So I've in some of the areas that I need to shoot more does in, I'm regulating, uh, I'm going to regulate how much feed I put out there. Plus, with cell cams these days, and my time being a dad, which you know about this, and business to run, if I can fill up my feeder and put my cell cam with a solar charger on it, I have to go once a month to fill it up. All I'm watching for, all right, they like go. Yep. And, and, and instead of every four days, I got to go put some feed out. And, or, or like I've got spots where they've emptied 600 pound protein feeders during October, nine and 10 days. That's pricey. Yep. I, I'm a, I'm a trail can. Of course, Chris and Keith, they, they, they give me a hard time about it, but I, I do watch the trail cameras and I feel like they don't lie. I, if you've mm-hmm. got a deer that's 10 o'clock every night and you got, as bad as I hate to say, because a lot of people they get three days, Friday, Saturday, mm-hmm. Sunday, or Saturday, Sunday to hunt, and and I totally understand it. But don't go till he daylight. If it's ten days and he's been there at ten o'clock at night, unless there is a front change, that's it. Or he daylights, it's not gonna miraculously just walk in. I, and now there will be a that may happen one time mm-hmm. out of the year. And if you were there that one day, you get lucky. But I feel like chancing it on the one time that he just does something random. Mm-hmm. You're gonna, you're gonna screw up. Put on you're gonna it screw hurts up more. That worse. Yeah, because what happens is if he let's say let's not use ten, let's use he's coming in at seven thirty. Yep. Well, you blow every doe out of there out when you get down risking it. Yep. Well, he knows. That's and it's why. It's like when you if you've got a deer and he's you know it's it's you're losing shooting light at five twenty and he's hugging that five forty mm. six o'clock. He's on the outskirts. You, yeah, you look at he he's close, and then you look at the weather and it's going from seventy eight to fifty eight. You're probably going to shoot that deer that yeah, afternoon. Yeah, I totally agree. Yep. I did this one time. We had a deer I called Biggie Smalls. Uh, the, he was probably, if I would have, if Blake, excuse me, if Craig would have shown up that day to film, I'd have killed him. It was the year, about five or six years ago, we had all those snows, more than normal, yep. which deer in Mississippi usually don't move in the snow, but we had so many, they were having to come to the feed. Anyway, I had to self-film, and I drew back on him didn't get him killed. That deer had never daylighted. Had two years of pictures. I'm actually had three years, but it at this time, it was two years of picture, never daylight. I saw what was going on. I was watching. It was a, it was in the rut. I said, today's the day. Yep. And I risked it for a biscuit, and he did. He daylighted in there that day. And I remember thinking the same thing. Yeah, you can do – I see it all the time, my clients. Man, he's coming in every night and every night. And on October 1st, they're sitting there and saying, why would you even go in there? Yeah. You got Something's got to change. Acorns got to change. Food's got to change. Rut's got to change. Weather's got to change. He, I'm not saying mirac- look, lucky things it do happens, happen. Yeah. But you if you do it like you're talking about, less pressure, you're gonna now look, don't I say it all the time, don't hunt hard, hunt smart yep. early season. And it's now, tough. I mean, my dad, for example, he's a, you know, but he grew, he's still in the deer camp I grew up in. And I mean, you get Saturday and Sunday hunt, you go. But like it and and the more I learned and longer I guess more opportunities I had to screw up and you mm-hmm. start getting smarter. You know, and he started changing, you know, going off our conversation, he started changing, like, he, you still go hunting, mm-hmm. but don't go, shoot, go hunt your best spot. Go shoot, uh, go, go on the outskirts. Yeah, go see if you can get lucky and catch him coming out of here or crossing here or doing this, but I'm not going to bust in there to that feeder that he's been 22 days straight all nighttime, mm-hmm. and I got the same temperature that I've had. There's nothing mm-hmm. there to make it change, right. and, and you're going to pressure it going in. So, good example, we had a spot in Kansas Craig uh, was hunting this giant. He was 171. 
Um, and we were hunting out. There was he was coming to like three feeders, but there was one he was going to do every day. He yeah. would like hit the other ones random. So the wind was right for the random. You can hunt it because yep. this is number one. He sh- shot the deer, wounded, <laughs> wounded the deer on the random feeder. Well, the wind got right the next day, and he went and hunt for four days in a row at that feeder. He always come to four days later. 171 inch deer walks up there. He smacks him. But it's a good example. You yep. know, like you said, if you do know that there's an outskirt, just go hunt the out. Because if you bump him off the yep. outskirt, that's fine because your number one's mm. still there. In fact, it may help you, number yep. one. Because I'm the same way. I mean, if we're if we're on the road and you, you're you on a six, seven day hunt, with, you know, in comparable, that'd be somebody that's got three weekends to hunt. Mm-hmm. Or, like, I'm not going to not hunt. Right. I'm, I'm, let's get that clear. I'm going to hunt, but. I'm I'm not gonna push if the wind's not right mm-hmm. and I and something hasn't changed to flip that over. Now that's different in Missouri or, or or places you can't feed. That's different. But as far as a feeder, you will 100 percent. And I would say this, I mean, and and stand behind it. If you will hunt smarter, wait for him to daylight a day or two, and also wait on a front. If mm-hmm. he's right there at dark and change, you will 100% be successful. And you will hunt way less days. If it's 92 degrees and the wind's not right, take your wife to the flower shop, buy this some flowers. This guy is smart. <laughs> I'm just saying. And and save up those days for, baby, It's today's the day. I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and it's Cody, and, and Cody's probably like me. You're at home hunting, and you know, I'm sitting there looking at the weather. I'm sitting there looking at the weather. All right, I usually pick, all right, I'm hunting Thursday afternoon. That's right. 100%. Yeah, I'm hunting Thursday. I'm like, the rest of this week, we're going to work. We're going to sell land. We're going to spend Lori, time. Lori, let's go out to eat Wednesday night. You want to go yeah. out to eat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's go out to eat. I know it's deer season, baby, yeah. but I love you. Yeah, they, they don't know it's east wind. You need north. I mean. That's right. That's right. It's a uh, So it's going to be interesting because, you know, we're dealing with a different time of the year, different weather, maybe different winds. Um, you know, uh, it's going to be fun, though. And that's what I'm excited about because it's going to be fun. It's going to throw in a wrench. Um, if you listened on the front of this podcast, that little intro, Heathco, our mutual friend, did that for me. That uh, rack buck down here on opening day in Mississippi has actually killed about 10 miles that way. Uh, it was on September the 30th because, you know, every once yep. in a while, Mississippi opened up on September the 30th. So I've always thought it was cool. I killed a deer in Mississippi on September, yep. in September. But this is going to be cool. I think we're going to learn a lot. You're going to have some negatives out there. Uh, but it's going to be some big deer killed. And yep. especially... If we get like where it's some rainy afternoons, maybe that weather cools down a little bit, it'll be some big. And it'll, it'll be it'll be interesting. That's what we were actually talking on um, Joey, uh, the testing house producer. We were talking back and forth, and it's like the chances of getting a front right there is slim. Very, very slim. First week, of, the first ten days of October every year, there's going to be a two to mm-hmm. three day swing, and that's when your big deer are killed in October. Right. But that happening in September, unless it's, I don't know, a hurricane or something, there, there's just not hardly the chance of it happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, speaking of, if that does happen, hurricane, I don't know if y'all ever watch your, when hurricanes, it throws them all off, they feed all day. I was watching trees fall in the background of mine and deer standing there I, eating. I've never seen stuff happen like it does when a hurricane's mm-hmm. in the area. Like, prime example, Chris Ashley, uh, I don't know, Five years ago, he shot a 178 up in Kentucky with our buddy Peanut. And uh, he had trail cam pictures. He's come to a spot twice. I think he had two sets of pictures of him. That was it. And they were at night. And this it hurricane opening day, I can't remember. I think it was coming in like September 3rd. Well, Hurricane Harvey, I think, came up through Louisiana. I could be wrong on the name. Comes up through, pushes all the way. Well, when we we're driving, it's raining. Mm-hmm. We get there, and it rains all day the day we get there, all day the next day, can't leave the house, all morning the next morning. And Chris goes, I'm going to go hunt him. And Pena's like, man, it's not it's not a guarantee. Like he, I've had like two sets. He goes, if he's ever coming back, he'll come back today. He shot him at like 4 o'clock. Wow. He stood straight up, rain stopped, walked straight in, shot him, 178, full velvet, unbelievable. But like hurricane, like that kind of front is very From, slim. Uh, Chris that. had to have more one sixty pluses than the rest of y'all, huh? He's got one hundred percent. Guy, he's killed some big deer. It is. Uh, he has more one hundred and sixty inch nine points than any man I know. Like it, it's like Kansas. He go to, I mean, all the different places. Here comes a hundred and sixty inch nine point. Walk right by. I shoot so. first aid too. I remember my dad after we've been to Kansas like six or eight years in a row. He said, "You gonna shoot the hundred first hundred fifty inch deer walk by you?" I said, "Absolutely." Yep. 
Um, so, and Chris, Chris is, you know, he he would have shot a one fifty two if he'd have came by. Him, but it's he he's he has killed some really big deer. Really big so. deer. Well, we're gonna get to the part of the podcast. Uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say on this. All right, so Cody, you know, being this is the Hunting Land Man podcast, um, tomorrow, me and you go across the river and you buy a lot. We buy a lottery tickets and you win a hundred million dollars net to you. Hundred million dollars. Where are we buying land and why? Hundred million now. Man, um, if I had a hundred million, I don't know. It'd be a tough call. I, we, I'm a, I'm a, are, I, are we I, moving? I don't. I probably wouldn't move. I think I, I love Mississippi. I love the seasons of Mississippi. I like the. I can get a tag. I can. Well, there, mm-hmm. there. I, I, there's plenty of stuff that there's kids don't have to wait till they're 12, 13 years old to hunt. Like, right. I, I like Southern hunting. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and I probably wouldn't uproot that just because I have money, but I would probably own an elk ranch. I will say I knew that. that was coming. <laughs> I would, I would go get an elk mule deer, that, that kind of deal. Texas would be high on my list mm-hmm. um, from the kid's side and the, inner, you know, to be able to take family and friends and to an elk, I mean, to a, a ranch in Texas. Um, but I, I would buy ground Mississippi for sure. Test, testing grounds may be that that would be top of my list. It's mm-hmm. not for sale, but it would uh, that if I could own it, I would mm-hmm. for sure. Tell you what, I, I I'm I'm fixing to put it on the market if we don't get it sold already. There's a track, so I don't I, you know I'm a product of where I'm from. So down here in Southwest Mississippi, some of the best areas are Anna's Bottom right here and Kingston. Uh, you know, they're both in Adams County and Jefferson up here a little bit. I've got a track I'm about to put on the market, and it's uh, 395 acres, hills and bottoms. It's got uh, the neighbor is, I won't say their name, but it's 25,000 acre right. neighbor um, that very few deer get shot on, very few ducks. So it's uh, it's hills and bottoms hunting. Um, but, you know, Cody and them hunt a lot of different areas, you know, up there in, in Madison and Yazoo and Atala County. All, you know, they've got some of that. They may would argue, no, this area is better uh, because they know those areas better. But for me down here, you know, that uh, we're getting into the Delta, that Kingston area, a lot of big old deer get shot in that Anna's Bottom area. I mean, I had 220 acres in Anna's Bottom, nowhere from where we're sitting right now that I was hunting. Got to hunt it for three weeks. I had seven, no high water, just regular water. Deer in October. I had 17 deer over four year old on camera on 220 acres. And see, one thing that for your area down here that's always amazing, like you look at, you post trail cam pictures all the time, and, and, and of course you have a lot of clients. You know, mm-hmm. obviously you've, you've done well here, and you get pictures sent to you. Right. Hey, I, I shot this deer on my place. Thanks. You know, so you share a lot of pictures, which the deer down here are, you know, good. And But the difference is like where we are, yes, I love the testing grounds, and, and that Yazoo area is a big deer. Mm-hmm. no turkeys ah and so from from my passion mm-hmm. being i mean i absolutely love turkey hunting and i'm gonna try to go every single morning that's that's kind of a killer so trying to find a place that's got 140 you know type deer 140 inch type deer but good turkey hunting um you would probably have a strong argument that this right in here is tough to beat. Right, I didn't. I never thought about it like that because you you are giving up that. I mean, of course, you get good, better ducks up there if that's right. even a thing yep. uh, anymore. But um, you know, a place with hills and bottom. There's something about when you go down in those river bottoms down here along the Mississippi River. When you go down in that smell, and I don't know. It's just every oh, time yeah. I go down there, like uh, I sell shares at Southside down here, and uh, they've got hills and bottom ground. I'm actually today closing on a part right beside their hills and bottoms. It's just special. And, you know, hunting is all about anticipation. Yep. You know, how many am I going to hear gobble? Uh, is the buck going to move today? And you can add an asterisk to that is, is the water going to come up this season? Yep. Because, you know, then, you know, throw all the cards out. You know, yep. like, oh, I may have, I may be hunting four shooters all year, but I got 10 now. Yep. Because the water came up, it changed. And, and I've noticed when that water comes up, they don't think it's clearly either. Oh no, it, it's totally. And when when a deer's dispersed, relocated, mm-hmm. it, it it's changed the game. I mean, there's no doubt. We've hunted several. You know, I'm not gonna say where at because I don't. You know, you've course, hunted terror a lot. Like, you yeah, know. but you, you, when when that water comes mm-hmm. up, it's it's magical. You know, it's a it really is, and it's 
you and it's hard to you know. Of course, I'm a salesman, but yep. Glenn sells itself, and either it checks your boxes or it don't. I just provide the information and fix problems if, if you know if we need to build a pond or need to get more ground, whatever. But when I tell a guy, say, look, this food plot right here, this is a common question on that yellow buggy. So, like, how many deer am I going to see in this food plot? I mean, I think you're going to see 10, 15 on a normal day, you know, pretty bluebird day in December. I said, but if that water comes up, you might see 60. Yeah. And when somebody says, but literally that can happen. Oh, there's happen. no doubt. And, and, and especially if you treat it right. Mm-hmm. And those deer real, I was telling, so that place is on the bluff I'm about to put on the market. I was telling the guy, I said, I said, those deer, they like that bluff because they go check that water every day or two, and they're back. And I said, if you'll treat this right and ease in from the public roads and just, I said, there ain't no telling what you can kill. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing is just the, it, you can do the little things right, like you said earlier, and, and you buy a piece of property, and it, it, you can't really always bank on what the previous landowner you did for think? success because if, if they rode buggies through there, you know, till two o'clock and then they ran back through there and threw everybody out and they checked trail cameras every single day. That's not comparable if you focus on access in, you know, like shield our product mm-hmm. backwoods, plant that in front of box stands to get in and hunt and get out without them knowing you're there. Now you're hunting and most would say, Well, you're hunting it, so you're pressuring. That's false. If you can get in and, in out, and out without, without something know it, you're hunting without pressure. How, how many I say this ten times I say that ten times a week. So if we're gonna design your place, let's design it. Because let me tell you, the food plots you can do that on are gonna be your best. Oh, place. there's no doubt. And hundred percent if I if I was to buy if you hundred million dollars, you said I want that that's I'm gonna go find the right track, but that's the first thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna set the entire thing up where I can get to and out of stands without spooking it. And one hundred percent whatever that maximum potential is. That single aspect of being able to get in and out will make it the best it can be. And, and it, I think people don't think, you know, they forget about that. And it's so much more fun. So, like, Cody's got kids. You know, you like, you know, at 4 o'clock, you can't, hey, I want to go hunting. Oh, crap, it's already too late. You know, if I was going hunting, I'd be in at 2.30. Yep. Well, if you do it like that, oh, man, 4.30, we crawled. It was 15 deer in the food plot. That's right. Oh, and, and and so I've said this before on the podcast, but I'll say it again. So if you set up your place right, all right, let's say you got a three or four-acre food plot. Today, you've been getting this deer on camera every four or five days. Now, we're, we're talking about rifle hunting right now. Okay, you've been getting this deer on camera every four or five days, okay? Well, if you can get in and out of there without spooking your deer, it just becomes a mathematical equation. If I go there five days in a row, according yep. to my camera, same weather, same everything, and don't spook anything, guess what? He's dead. Yep. I mean, that's that's the difference in putting your box stand in the right place with the right wind. Uh, and with these box stands today, you can get away with so much more wind. Mm-hmm. At prime example, you, you take Kansas or somewhere, mm-hmm. somewhere that you can see a long ways. You're hunting draws. I don't know how many times we've gone in deers five days in a row. It's, it should be a done deal. Mm-hmm. It's five days in a row. And then you go, and you're like, the deer's bedded over here. You know, so the wind's perfect. You go, he don't show. He don't show. He don't show. Then come to find out a week later, he's bedding over here. Mm-hmm. One time that he knew you were there changed his entire path. He, he, he was watching. And yeah. same deal, and, mm-hmm. and I've never understood like why you don't take that same concept, getting in a food plot, getting out of a food plot without being undetected, is you climb down, you didn't see him that day. He's 12 yards in the woods scanning. Well, or, 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 so he's you 40, blow out 10 or, or he's 40. A hundred yards in the woods, and that doe with a head this long goes out blowing. Yep. He knows what just happened. It alerts. He's still standing out there. A big deer's not going to move. So mm-hmm. he's going to stand there and assess because he, he ain't got shot yet, so he's safe right. where he's at. Whoa, there goes the side-by-side. Whoa, he was here. Mm-hmm. Puts it all together. Mm-hmm. And and it's – that's like – at testing grounds last year, we, we committed to – putting those box stands and planting, you know, shield is, mm-hmm. it's got three If y'all seen seeds. on Cody, I think they posted it on Small Town's page or either Cody's page this week. There's that food plot that's shaped kind of like a kidney. And yep. what they did was they planted that shield box stand in the middle. You can see the brown spot on it where the feeder is, but you're creating success. So I hear clients all the time, oh, Slade, you said I'd see 10, 15 deer in this food plot. We're not seeing but two or three. My first thing I say is tell me your routine. Yep. Oh, well, we get there on Thursdays. You know, usually not in time to hunt, but the kids like to go trek to Kelham right after dark. I said, well, stop right there. Yep. So it's been perfect all week, no activity, and then we're going on the side-by-side of the golf cart. Well, we're going electric cart. Yeah, but 
Yep. It's at night when the deer are there. You know, it's and deer are creatures of habit. So what Cody and them are doing, you know, they're planting and they're creating success by at some point that deer's got to come through that hourglass and get a shot with a bow because they're yep. bow hunting only there now. So you can create success. Uh, look, look. Blake DeBall says it all the time. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. I agree. But you can create these scenarios of success. And you hear Cody. I've never talked to Cody about a lot of this stuff, but it's the exact same things I preach all the time. Yep. And that, it's the first two things you pull up and you're setting up a brand-new food plot or setting up brand-new property. How can I get in and out mm-hmm. without them knowing and then wind? So I And there's a lot of times like, man, I, I want that stand on that end for north wind. But I'm looking on the other end. And I'm like, man, I, I could plant shield right in front of it, come right off the road and get in it. It's got to be a south wind spot. That's the two mm-hmm. things I'm playing when I'm setting it up. And, you know. I would rather, with a good box stand, I would rather w- risk it on the wind a little bit, be scent free, maybe run some kind of ozone in the stand or some, a crave around yep. it or something. I'd rather do that and be able to get in and out than have a perfect north wind spot. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. And then another thing, you know, we did was we planted circle shield spots around some some large food plots. And what we did while we did that was sometimes like that's where they're at, and you got to hunt it. Well, mm-hmm. I still want to be able to get in and out, and I still want to be able to manipulate the wind. So what we did is we planted, you know, ten yard, twelve yard circles, and let shield grow up. So you got, I know, there's. 12 to 15 foot grass that's mm-hmm. thick in three different spots. It's Egyptian so if he's wheat, showing Egyptian, up on that well, camp, and if y'all don't know, it's Egyptian wheat and Sudan grass, and the whole idea is to shield your entrance in that. That's camp. correct. And the three different blends grow where one's growing four foot thick, the next one gets thick from four to eight foot, then the next one's mm-hmm. thick from eight to 12. So from 12 foot down, it's a wall. Mm-hmm. And so we went and planted those three different sections where if he keeps showing up there and we need to hunt him, we'll go brush in there. So you can break that stuff off, tuck it right. in the middle, put it all around the blind. We did that all season and was hunting ground blinds in Mississippi, which is hard to do, mm-hmm. the same day we put it out because we went ahead and put the structure there where we could brush them in. We're not trying to go brush it on the edge of the field and pile a bunch of limbs. Right. They've been looking at that grass all day. We go and cut some holes and get in there. So it's a uh, it's and this kind of see this kind of stuff is so much fun to me. Like like you know, preparing and doing, and when, when it all works, I mean, 95% of the time, you know, it's like, oh, I had a plan, it didn't yeah. work out, well, when it all works out, it's like, man, this is oh, awesome. Oh, no doubt. Mm-hmm. So, but that, that's, that was the funnest part, that's what we dedicate, like, this past year, we really, really spent the time on how do you get in, how do you get out. There's some of them you can't do. I mean, mm-hmm. there's just some don't work, and you got to know that, but your best spots will always be the ones that if you can figure that out that will be the best plots on the property like you said all right well as we're ending here i'm going to ask a question so we're going to leave everybody with this opening day let's just paint a picture you're hunting over a food plot to testing grounds and you got a feeder out in that food plot what's planted and what's in the feeder oh in the feeder would be probably still rolling flame kissed or buck tree up okay um, because of september 16th there will be a decision to made, you know, that's kind of right there at the end of everything. Have you made the shift to straight corn? Mm-hmm. If you're somebody that's not going to feed protein year round right. and you're trying to, you know, switch to corn only, there's a decision to be made. But I would probably not change anything from the summer. I would hunt that weekend just as if I've done everything all summer. After that weekend is when I would go into the fall. So I would swap over to corn or whatever. As far as what's planted, um... I think a lot of people are going to go some summer blends this year. Mm-hmm. They're going to have that, whether that's like Velvet Plus or Bachelor Pad that we have, an early season blend. They're Which gonna, one of those two has the uh, uh, Alice Clover in it? That is Bachelor Pad. Okay. So, you know, you could plant something like that. You've got it up. It's really good. You've got your feeder there. They're coming to the feeder. They got plenty of food. You're going to ride that out, and then October you disc it up. You know you roll with them. One thing pot. you know, if you're going to do like me, thinking cost and time wise, oh, um, my plan is to go with a summer blend. But no, he's got me thinking about these. I may have two different options right there at the house with some um, with trophy acre. But anyway, so if you go in and you do plant, let's say you say, all right, I got the good deer coming in. I'm going to do everything perfect. I'm going to come in on. August 1st, and I'm going to, I got some rains coming. I'm going to plant some bachelor pad. One thing about it is if you do your fertilizer and everything right, 
you can come back with like a big three yep. and just overseed right before rain. And you, you've already got your fertilizer there. You might have to put some ammonia later. Yep. But uh, that's something to think of. So go in, plant your summer. F- you're hunting that until mid-October, until we start getting some cold fronts. Come in right before rain with your four-wheeler or tractor or hand seeder and put your, your big three out because your wheat, oats, and ryegrass – with a rain, they're going to come in. Yep. If your ground's any decent, there it's going to come in. They grow in the back of your truck. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's going to be – it's cool because these are all new tap- tactics. We've been hunting these same areas our whole life, and now we got something new to play see, with. See, the thing is you can't just run out and say, okay, well, now we're hunting September 16th, so I want my food plot up. I'm going to go in September 1st and plant it. Army worms, everything else. So that's See, that's something that last year was the worst, worst year I've ever seen in it. the whole country. Yep. I and mean, one thing that I like is they're not going to mess with your turnips. Army Did not worms. know that. Yes, so army worms ate up everything we had. Like so, we plant test plots, mm-hmm. and and we every blend. You know, that they we didn't ever, eat them up. They didn't eat us up in Missouri. Now, you think of that because they ate the natural grass in Missouri. That's correct. And and they were eating everybody's uh, um, alfalfa, yep. but they didn't eat our turnips. Good yep. point. And so that was one thing that if I was really, I would take that into consideration with like trophy acre. We've got some uh, some new blends coming. One of them's called Sweet Greens. And it was really, uh, we worked close with Blair Goins on a lot of stuff. And, of course, you. And we take everybody that Backwoods works with, like, what holes do we have? What do we need? What is the sweet greens? Tell me about that. Um, Not completely final. But it, it's going to have your, it's really, really based on where you have early season as far as radishes and uh, rape. Where you have that immediate green up broad leaves mm-hmm. to hold them, then you got turnips in there for late season. So it's a really good early season, and then they may move off, you know, wheat, oats, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then they come back in there for late season. So sweet greens is a good option, but mm-hmm. um, but late uh, as far as trophy acre, it's tough to beat. Um, just the the blend that it has and the army worms. If I had to tell somebody, like they told me, you know, hey, I'm gonna be out of town October. November and man, I, I really need to shoot a velvet buck, or I may not kill a deer. Trophy acre be tough to beat because you it eliminates a lot of things. You got to hit a rain in August, but if you can get it up when everybody else is fighting army worms, you're not, and you're gonna you're gonna have something green right there for you know that early velvet season. So that's probably I'm I'm gonna I got five acre spot right in front of my house, and I kind of got a two acre spot, and it comes into kind of a destination food plot which I watched 30 hogs run out of at daylight this morning. So right. I've got to get a trap in there ASAP, which is going to be something else we throw into the mix, you know, with hogs with that September 16th. But um, that's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into the turnips then because I was thinking straight summer, but now with the army worms and I didn't think about them turnips being able to do better early like that. Something interesting. Yep. Caleb, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Well, Cody, I appreciate you uh, being on here. We're going to uh, – got some closings to go do. Me and um, cameraman Caleb got some filming to go do for episode six or seven, whatever we decide to do the Nat- Natchez episode on. But um, if you'll hit that little blue button over there, Caleb, and we'll get out of here. Y'all have a blessed day.